and welcome to another exciting night at GTA Luck. <laughs> uh, we're, this is our July 27th meeting. So to start things off, is this actually plugged into a speaker? Uh, to start things off, we have a couple of announcements. To start things off, we have a couple of announcements. Um, we have upcoming meetings. So on, on August 8th, we have the tour project. Um, the 12th of September, we have Xterm and Docker. And on the 10th of October, we have the state of Mozilla with Mike Hoyne. OK? Um, so we have some upcoming, we have an upcoming event. On the 22nd of July at 2 PM, we have Linux in the park. Uh, it'll be held this year at Hack Lab. Uh, just come by the Hack Lab, and you'll be redirected to where it is. It's actually in the backyard of Hack Lab in that area. Hack Lab is at Queen and Dufferin. It's very Googleable. Um, yes. No, we're, we're going to be a, we're going to be on. Yeah, we're going to be on the bridge. So we're the non-troll people. The people who get sucked by the trolls? I'm not really sure. Tonight, we are going to be having lightning talk. That says lightning. No, it doesn't. It says lightning. <laughs> so, how lightning talks work is the speaker is allocated five uninterrupted minutes for their talk. After the speaker has concluded their time, the audience is, out, is then allocated five minutes of questions. Notice questions and not long drawn out statements. If you would like to do a statement, you can put your name on a post-it note with what your statement is going to be and put it on the board over there. Please note, I will be, I will be diligent in who, what I consider statements. As always, please respect the speaker as they're talking because they're giving a five minute talk and it's kind of stressful to be up here doing that. So without further ado, this nice mountain Vic, we are going to hand it over to um, to have okay <laughs> on how does enterprise kernels get made? How do enterprise how kernels? Do Oh, perfect. Over here we have a 10 minute clock. It awesome. will go, it'll start green, it'll then go at 5 minutes, it'll go yellow, and then red at Who stops it? 10. I'm going to, well, you can start drop seven. There you go. Okay, folks, uh, I'm Pavel, and I work with the Oracle kernel team. I'm part of the Unbreakable Enterprise kernel team, and uh, we ship enterprise kernels. So I'm, I'm going to spend some time talking about how we build enterprise kernels. Uh, now in the past, I have also been somewhat peripherally involved in the Red Hat process and the SLES process. So some bits are common, and then I will go and talk about specific bits that happen with the Oracle un Unbreakable Enterprise Kernel uh, process. Uh, so, so here's what generally tends to happen is uh, a bunch of kernel developers get together and they figure out, hey, you know, or, or rather their bosses figure out that, hey, we're coming up to this point in time where we need to have our next major release. Uh, that might be uh, upcoming, would probably be rel 8. I am not sure what the SLES numbering is uh, because it used to be tied to OpenSUSE, but OpenSUSE went up to 42 or 43, and then after that they came back, so I'm, I'm really confused as to where they are. Uh, but, but what happens is, Somebody there decides that, hey, we are, going to, we are going to need to have a next major release coming up. And when that happens, uh, we need to decide uh, that a kernel needs to be built, uh, or rather the kernel needs to be put along with this distribution. Now, generally, at this point in time, you tend, you tend to have a version in mind. So, so the Linux kernel development cycle is actually very, very settled. You tend to have a release every three odd months. And so you, you know if you need to have, let's say, your release in December, you want to start stabilizing your kernel come June. Uh, so so you, know, you need to have everything in by June. You know what is the release that's going to happen in and around June. So, so you start planning according to that, and you try to get your features in before that happens. So, so most enterprise distros, we try to keep uh, all the features we want in the kernel we are shipping 
upstream before we bring it back into our kernel. So, so the, the goal is get your feature upstream. You know what version you're targeting, and, and so you, know, you go ahead and do that. Uh, that's the common view with all the major distros. Uh, now, what happens in Oracle is slightly different from all of this. Uh, we have an un what we call the unbreakable enterprise kernel where we pick a certain release and then we start developing on top of that. The current version we do is 4.1. It's a 4.1 series kernel. Uh, and every quarter we provide an update. So you know what my team does is we have three streams going in at the same time. One is the master tree, which is where everything keeps happening. One is the release tree, which is going to be the next quarterly update. And then the third stream is the release tree, where we keep sending out bug fixes. Uh, so I, I myself, I maintain the release tree. And I keep accepting features. We keep backporting features from our, uh, the tree that is, um, that is the master tree. Now, the other interesting bit that keeps coming about with distro kernels is uh, the, we need to maintain something what we call as ABI. ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. This is very important because uh, some of you might know about this, others might not. Linux does not have stable ABI. And what this means is that a driver that was made today may not work on a kernel that is out three months down the line. Uh, and future releases. And what happens is most enterprise distros, when you have a driver come out, uh, you, you tend to certify that driver for the duration that the release is uh, in, you know, it's in its life cycle. So, so that is one other thing enterprise distros do separate, different from what community distros do. Community distros tend to keep upgrading their kernels. They don't provide this guarantee because you know it's expensive and people sign expensive support contracts to do this. Uh, another type of updates that are very important are security updates. Now, uh, I don't know, how many of you are sysadmins here? Yeah, quite a few. So. So the one thing you will uh, agree with me is every time you get an update, you need to decide, is the update worth rebooting? Because you're bringing down downtime, your hardware might not come back up, uh, lots of other things. So one of my other tasks is figuring out, is a security update important enough that I push it out right now and tell my customers to have a reboot immediately, or can it wait for our next what we call the errata, which comes out once a month. Uh, I am running out of time, so I'm going to end with the one last thing. Uh, if you, however, are you know in a critical situation where you need to have all security fixes coming in, uh, we have something called as case splice. Case splice allows you to upgrade your kernel without rebooting. Uh, it is also available for Fedora. Uh, questions. Oh yeah, anybody has questions, please go to the microphone. I guess m my understanding is the only need reason you need stable ABI is for out of tree drivers. Is that correct? Uh, no. It is also needed, say, for the database itself because they are relying on some things that are being exposed. Uh, it it might also be drivers that uh, you are maintaining long term. It's not necessarily in tree, uh, you know, or it might be exotic hardware, which is which is your out of tree uh, drivers bit. Your let's say your database, mm -hmm. let's call it Oracle, um, <laughs> is using kernel ABI. That's pretty weird because because you the, want performance. The ABI. There's two ABIs, I think. One of them is the ABI that's exposed to user land. Right. And the other one is within the kernel. Correct. And it's the Linus is pretty clear that he wants a stable user land ABI. He's very careful about that. Uh, so and I, I, want to, I want you to take a step back and actually understand what Linus is uh, very clear on. He's very clear on that you do not break the kernel user space API. And 
that would normally translate to your ABI as well. And the way you do that is you extend the structure. You don't uh, insert things in the middle and so on. Uh, that, however, when, when you start backporting fixes from the future, that may not be necessarily true when it comes back to your kernel. Not completely clear, but in broad strokes, it's the kernel ABI, which is the pro internal one, that's a real problem, isn't it? That's declared. Both. Both are the problem. What you are exposing to the user, because you have to understand, sometimes you might need to recompile your uh, your software. You don't, you don't want to do that. As I've understood it, Linus is want it to be binary interface that's stable, not the source interface. No, it's API stability. API? Yes. Because I've, I've seen things that made no sense unless you wanted ABI stability. It is API stability. Okay. Yeah. More questions? We have one minute, 35 questions, seconds. Okay, so then I'll call David for behavior directed design. Yep. Yeah. Right, thank you. Hi, so um, uh, so tonight, for the people who just came in, we're doing lightning talks. Um, if you get inspired at any moment, you can find Scott, who has the post-it notes in a Sharpie, and write down the, your talk title and your name. We currently have a couple coming up. Um, we're just kind of, do you want to do a USB key? Uh, HDMI to um, the mini. Oh, Scott Scott one. So, so um, in other things, uh, let's do a quick distro survey. How many people are using a Debian variant? <laughs> okay. Yes, it's a new Ubuntu. Well, it's a new Ubuntu variant, which is a W. That doesn't matter. Uh, how many people are doing a Red Hat variant? Um, how many people are running a, an Oracle variant? <laughs> yeah. Um, how how many people are um, what, doing Slackware variant? <laughs> Any Arch users? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, how many people run more than one distribution? How many people run more than one distribution in their non-variant thing? D David's ready, we'll t discuss this later. <laughs> so, um, here, yes, take the microphone. Microphone. Great. Any salutations? And uh, here's the timer. Thank you. Start. Yeah. Okay, right. 959. All right. So. I've been doing a little bit of work uh, with behavior directed development. Uh, not, this is not uh, BDD as in Drew Sullivan and, and bondage and discipline. This is, this is just plain ordinary development. And when it first came out, it was very definitely hyped. It was supposed to be the snazziest thing in the world. And I looked at it and said, no, not doing that. And then I had a little problem. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. Some of this hype is for real. For an acceptance test and a certain class of re regression test, this is not bad at all. And in fact, it's a hell of a lot more succinct than the TDD tests that I had been, been writing uh, in, pardon the expression, Java at the time. So here's a real example. This is the actual language. Scenario, create a file. Given, 
is an actual keyword. No such object as that. When we can put an object from a file, then it exists. Gee, that sounds relatively simple. And therefore, I've, what I have proven is that put worked. This is a language that anybody who, could, who writes uh, stories, uh, user stories, can understand. You say what it is you're trying to prove. You say the givens, which are the prerequisites for your, your proof. You say when, and you actually execute the code. And then you have one or more then clauses that test to see if the results are what you expect. So this then turns into, in this particular case, uh, Python. So the string there, we can put object with a variable from file with a variable turns into a call to def impl, step impl, with its own little parameter context, and then the two keys from here. All of a sudden, I've turned declarative statement into executable program. I can compute the first path. I implement a put call, path the full path the data, and I write a check on the result to see that it hasn't thrown an exception. That's my when clause. So that says, when I do this operation, first of all, it didn't blow up. And then I'm going to have a then clause to make sure that it actually did something useful. It does have some disadvantages. For example, anything in the givens is, uh, sorry, if you can't get everything in the givens as a prerequisite, if you have to organize tests one right after another, you're going to drive yourself nuts. Uh, it assumes an implementation language that is you know, normally structured, but the steps, the implementation language, are subroutine calls. They can't share things. But all of those bindings, all the when clauses, they're all globals. So there's, there's a conceptual mismatch in the language. And it's not the neatest thing in the world. You end up with global variables or some variables that you, you make up called context. Uh, and it can get a little strange. Uh, Python was supposed to make it easier, but I'm not a good Python programmer. So that was sort of like neutral. It didn't make it easier, it didn't make it harder. But what it did do is it addressed three separate problems that I had. I needed it for acceptance tests for a guy who had just done cowboy and wrote a simple uh, storage system with, a, with an image resizer in it. So the acceptance test fit in one file. Not a long file about yay if I printed it out. I can do the complete acceptance test. When he comes up with a bug, and he's on his about his third at this point, I can do a regression test that tests for that bug. I can't dive into the innards of things, though. This is not like a Java test or, or a Go test that's written in the same language that's compiled into the same unit. This is a white box test. So it, it's not a replacement for TDD, but it's surprisingly good for stuff. I would have killed for this in my previous gig. I had a wadge of dead code. Hundreds of interfaces, and I know about 25 are in use. But it was in Java. So I say, OK, so what's my dead code? And the Java compiler says, none. So here I can write a few files that test all the happy paths. That's going to tell me which of my interfaces are actually used. Find the live code. That's a huge step towards getting rid of all the crappy dead code. I'm going to comment out all the non, all the stuff that might, that I'm not testing, <laughs> and then see if it still works. And boy, I, as I said, I would have killed for that. And the last win is it can do performance tests. So. The step impl here takes a read timeout. And the, the Python requests module has a version of the get 
that allows me to set timeouts. Okay, so I've got an interface that typically takes uh, 10 milliseconds. I put in a 10 millisecond timeout as a floating point number here, and I, and I add that to the, the regression test. Every single time my developer runs the regression test, this passes until he puts in something really slow and, slow and stupid, in which case it suddenly fails. And he goes, oh, hey, Dave, what's this test do? <laughs> oh, that's, that's the test for it's way too slow. Oh, oh, well, just a sec, I'll look at that. <laughs> so I won, won, won three different ways on this one. It did my high-level test that I wanted. It will do the let's eliminate the dead code tests, uh, especially my current project. And it, it gives me my sort of basic first level performance test to keep me from doing something stupid and accidentally having a regression that doesn't make it buggy, but it does make it uh, run slow. So what am I going to do with this from now on? Uh, well, I'm going to switch over to Go because I can write Go faster than I can learn Python. In fact, I can write Go faster than I can learn almost anything. <laughs> Since I already learned it, you guys know that. And I'm going to use it in my current stuff so that I will always have the white box test around. And it will be small, and I don't have to spend much time on it. And if I really have something titchy, then I, I can write TDD tests for that. But for this, for the high level view, for getting stuff out of the way, this is lovely. It's almost as good as the hype guys say. Question. Question. What, uh, this looks like there's a separate language. What do you have to install in order to, to use this? And that comes with the with the Python package. Uh, it is a Python package. Uh, ah. Uh, there, there is there is a Perl uh, dialect of this language, uh, which I assume is on C. What does TDD stand for? Test Test Directed Development. Okay. Um, so you called this white box, but it looks like it tests the whole system rather than units. Is that correct? That's right. But I can, I can use it down to a fairly low level. Uh, I'm using it to test the entire thing via a, via a REST interface, but I can, I can do ordinary subroutine call type tests with it as well. So I could, I could test right down to the unit. I just, I'm just in a, in a different language and I can't reach inside the box and do things. So it's really black box the way you're using it right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I said that entirely backwards. White box is where you can see it. Yes. Yeah, black box. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> much, okay. much appreciated. Black boxes matter. <laughs> yeah, white boxes, electrodes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically, when you said you can find dead code, I assume that means you have a tool that will indicate the coverage of your testing. Yes, I do. And that's the normal language uh, co uh, test coverage. To yeah, I mean, it's easy to guess, but you yes. didn't say it, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and that, was, that, was, that was a huge Java program of infinite number of lines, <laughs> hundreds of interfaces, <laughs> et cetera. Other questions? Uh, we're at zero. It's fine. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Scott, do you mind coming up here and asking questions while I set up? What kind of questions am I looking for? All righty. Um, go. Tacos, okay. We, we have a vote for uh, uh, favorite. Now I'm just having words thrown at me. This is beautiful. That's a good call. Thank you. Good suggestion. We usually wait till the absolute last minute on the mailing list for deciding when where we're going to eat. Can I get a... Um, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the theme for the night. <laughs> I have a. You have the mic. Alex, is this good? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to. Ugh. Your, your phone keeps going out of Wi Fi. 
Okay, I'm gonna put this here. Okay, hi. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, Mastodon, which is a new social network that's taking over social networking spaces. Um, so at its core, Mastodon is just like the bird site, where, but with a kind of different naming convention. Uh, as an example, instead of tweeting, you toot. And you have a 500 character limit instead of the normal Twitter 140. Um, but I think this is, you can't interrupt me during a lightning talk. So <laughs> Mastodon is much more awesome, in my opinion, than Twitter and most other social networking systems. So for the first major thing, Social networking, traditional social networking sites have done nothing for people's privacy and probably even less for people's actual safety online. Um, but the nice thing about Mastodon is it actually provides you with tools that you can beat back. I, was, I had this time better the last time. You can beat back um, the different types of trolls that you might inherit. There's actually blocking support. There's also what's called block list support where you are given a list of people who are bad uh, internet people and you can block them en masse. Um, you can block at the instance level. So if you don't like people from a certain area, you can just block them. Uh, this provides a little bit better ways of, of having better privacy and safety online. Ah, the next thing, Mastodon is actually being developed open source. It's not a commercial product. So a lot of its tagline is actually no advertising, no analytics based off of what you're doing on it. It is simply just a place where you can go and share what's going on in your life. Um, it's, <laughs> it's currently being developed on GitHub uh, and under the GNU, I'm probably going to mispronounce, Alfresco license. Okay. The next thing is that it's completely decentralized. This means that there are multiple different Mastodon nodes that you can you can basically decide whether or not you want to connect with. So as an example, I have my own private node, which is my own. I can connect to someone else's node, uh, such as, uh, I'm not recognizing anyone as a Mastodon account at this thing, Bill's. I can connect to Bill's and Mike's Mastodon account and be able to not be on the same thing and be in our own spaces. Um, so how do you find an instance that you want to join? You go to instance.mastodon.xyz and you fill out a survey asking you a bunch of questions such as, do you want an instance where not safe for work is, is kind of hidden? Do you want an instance where there is a code of conduct? Do you want an instance where there isn't a code of conduct? So you get it basically what you need. These, in my opinion, other than my own, which no one else but myself is allowed to be on, are probably my favorite ones that have kind of been around. Um, there's actually one currently dedicated to the Toronto music scene, which is really cool. So it's a bunch of people who like like music, produce music, go to shows and everything on like their own instance. Um, there's Kitty Town, which is largely for kind people. Uh, there's LinuxRocks.online, which is for people who, li who love Linux. And then my personal favorite, Targaryen, which is Fire and Blood. Uh, of course, I said before, you can do a single single user mode, which basically, it basically takes the root of your instance and redirects it to your actual profile. It does basically nothing else besides not allowing anyone else to register or anything of that nature. If you just want to have uh, one, one kind of thing just for yourself and at your own domain, you can easily do it like that. Um, so, there's probably someone about to yell, I heard Bob, uh, Yolkman discussed GNU Social and Status.net a few years ago. Well, so GNU Social is another social, net, social network that is similar to Mastodon in pretty much every way except it's written in PHP. Um, of course, GNU Social and Mastodon communicate through the same um, library-based system called ActiveStream, which is actually produced by the W3C. Uh, this allows them to intercommunicate within different things. And wow, that's going fast. Uh, <laughs> and so this means that you can basically have a dance party with all your other great clones. Yes. Um, of course, you can't follow Bob if you're on Mastodon because he has decided not to upgrade his version of GNU Social, so you can't follow him. 
the thorn in my side, and I've emailed them many times about it. Um, so what Mastodon users think? So I kind of got up this morning and decided to ask the Mastodon community what they thought. I got about 100 replies, but I didn't really want to put them all in here, so I kind of gave up after I got the first three. <laughs> so the first thing, which I thought was really interesting because I learned a new language exists, is there's actually Mastodon instances in almost every language now. It's been translated to like that weird Star Trek one, to that weirder Esperanto one. Um, the person who's actually talking here is using a language called Octane. Octane? Octane? Oh, that word. Um, which is a French, German, it's, it's a dialect within a certain part of Europe. Um, there's also this really cool thing because small communities have developed around certain Mastodon instances. So you get these just interesting kind of like art world going on where people are making just like really cool artistic stuff just on the regular and they're all collaborating with each other and it's all this interesting kind of interplay between it. And I think on Twitter it would be kind of difficult because it, it doesn't allow for like that type of like people actually love their instance. Like they see themselves as a citizen of that instance. So it creates these just cool small communities around it. So um, you can of course follow me at this address, miles.life at me. Um, and uh, is there any questions? Uh, please go to the microphone. Does it take more than 30 seconds to create an account? Uh, I would say probably with like the actual, like, is this email address real? It takes probably a little bit longer than 30 seconds because you have to verify your account. But it's not certain, like, it will take you a little bit longer. That's all. Oh, anything else? Microphone, please. <laughs> The other important question, what is the base? How many users are there? I mean, the tech behind Twitter and Facebook, etc., there's nothing special about them. What attracts people to them is that that's where the other people they want to talk to are. And so the best tech can't deal with that. Ages ago, I, what seems like ages ago, I was invited to use something called Ello that said, oh, we're going to, cre we're going to fix everything that was wrong with Facebook. Uh, and it sort of has languished. The tech is still there. The good feelings and good intentions are still there, but nobody has, nobody has gone behind that parade. So, so um, I have to answer your questions before time runs out. Uh, the, there is this really fascinating book I once read about how they were able to, to calculate the votes of the first presidential election in the United States and what mathematical principles they had to go through to do that. When you have a federated kind of system, it's really difficult to say there are X number of users. So there are current studies trying to be going on where basically um, there's a bot that tries to follow everyone and that's trying to tally up. At the last kind of like, this is what we estimate the feed, which, which is called the feedverse. This is the, the size of the feedverse that we kind of estimate it as. It was around half a million active users. Now, those half a million, there's probably, I would guess, one tenth are English speaking. The rest are an assortment of other languages, including Japanese, which has a huge community with this artistic community called uh, Papawu. Pa, 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 Papawu. Papawu. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing that. Um, so there is a large community that's going around it, but what's more kind of important where like Elo kind of failed is Elo never gave investment, like there was no reason for you to be on Elo. Like you, you, were the, you were the product in that situation. Like they of course had these fancy ideas of ad, ad, based, ad revenue based models and things of that nature and of course it never really panned out. Like they're currently trying to like revamp their system again. Um, so I can answer that in more detail, but I have 20 seconds. So, Chris. Uh, how easy is it for us to set up a Mastodon? It's village? very difficult. Um, <laughs> so. I, I would honestly not suggest you do it. Um, it has it literally become 
just very complicated in terms of a multi, a, a Ruby app, a Node.js app, and a Postgres database. And then I think there's another programming language on top of that. It's meant to be web scale, and it's not doing well. And I have zero seconds. Thank you for your time. Uh, Stuart. Yes. Um, so, well, Stuart, uh, yeah, let's go back to the original question. Tacos. Uh, we have some. Uh, interest in tacos. Can I see the, the hands for uh, uh, sandwiches? Hands for sandwiches. Hands for ramen. One, oh, a few ramen folks in the fan. Folks in the fans. Fans in the folks. Um, let's go for uh, Thai hands. Let's see the Thai hands. Okay. Uh, let's go for the McDonald's crowd. Good. No hands. I like that. Um, let's go for the pizza crowd. Let's go for the wings crowd. Ah, some wings folks. Ooh, Indian. That's a good suggestion. Indian, raise your hand. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of the same hands keep up, so we know who are brave about their preferences and like food. The rest of you, I assume you don't like food. <laughs> More tacos. Okay. Let's pick a different question. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the beer question. Um, So there, there is a wiki page where people are adding dinner options in the area. Uh, so if you know of a place that we haven't hit, check the GTA log wiki and please add it. If someone will do the effort. The, prob the problem with... All right. Next speaker. <laughs> I have five minutes on the retro cam, and you can shut up right now. Um, very important question, do you want this with annoying music or without annoying music? I have Nyan Cat that plays and gets faster. With um, Okay, well, let's see what we can do here. Um, so what I was doing on the weekend was at the Maker Festival, and for my employer, um, can you guys hear this? It's very, very, very annoying close to you, and it gets a lot faster. So I'll actually stop it for later. Um, it's running MicroPython on the BBC Microbit. Anyway, totally unnecessary. Um, so I had a little uh, tweet camera printer thing, and I did absolutely everything wrong, but it worked out all in the end. Um, Raspberry Pi with Raspberry Pi camera, it has screen preview, you press the big red button, it prints out your picture in glorious old time Atkinson black and white dither, and it tweets the result, and there was much rejoicing. Um, do I need to describe what Raspberry Pi is? Yes, no, yes, no. Okay, no, good. Um, but it ha it's a little computer with some GPIO on it, so some pins, you can get some, some stuff out of it. Um, the Raspberry Pi camera is a dedicated little board. Um, it's kind of like a cheap old fixed focus uh, uh, cell phone camera. Uh, it doesn't use v v V4L, so it's really easy to use, maybe. Um, Thermal printer, I've been trying to talk about these things for about four years at this group. I've never managed to sneak it in, so this is my chance. Um, they're meant for till receipts. They print uh, 48 millimeters wide, uh, to uh, eight dots per millimeter. They talk a subset of some proprietary Epson language. You c I've written a very simple Python driver, but someone's written a really nice full feature driver for cups, which runs really slowly on a Raspberry Pi. But it does work. Um, and of course, there's a necessary big red button, arcade style button with a micro switch pushed, to, and it had an LED so you could make it pulse and go wow, wow, wow. And I did do that. Um, so the software I did to use to uh, talk to the various things GPIO0, totally Raspberry Pi reliant, but so simple. Uh, literally, those two lines set up a GPIO-based button, and then when you press the button, the take picture event happens. So if you've defined take, take picture, it'll go there. The next bit, two lines to make an LED pulse, good on it. Um, Raspberry Pi camera, that is literally all the setup code to get a nice little screen that would print on uh, the, the printer. 
and camera capture gets your image. And it went out through Titan, which I'm not going to explain even at all because it's like totally obvious or not. Um, Atkins, we use Atkins Dither. It was the old thing from HyperCard. It's, uh, it kind of looks nice. It's a bit dotty and uh, it has nasty artifacts, but less nas nasty than Floyd Steinberg. If you want the code, uh, GitHub Magursky at slash Atkinson, it only runs under Python 2. Because they changed the API in Python 3. How stupid can they get? Um, so I previously written a so I had all this set up and it totally didn't work. Um, my own driver didn't work for some reason. It just gave an error and I haven't changed anything. So what? Um, the Atkin C module doesn't work with Python 3 and all the other stuff was supposed to be Python 3. And then we ran out of paper and so I had to make the prints a lot smaller otherwise they wouldn't, we'd run out of paper. And so I was rewriting a PPD in mid-show. If anyone's ever written a PPD, they know they're horrible. But uh, yeah, that was fun. No, it wasn't. Um, so these are the remarkably spiffy results. This is the last picture I took. Um, and it printed you a little receipt with like the name of my employer, who I'm not going to push right now. Um, but this ten percent. Oh, damn it. Um, and if this works, come on, come on. This animation is supposed to work. This is all of the people. And it just looks around. There are only maybe about 180 people pressed the button. And some pictures of arms and chins and people who didn't mean to be taking pictures of. Um, and I am done with 13 seconds to go. Thank you very much. Questions? My question is, do you have... Um do you know about 3D uh, printing software? Like, uh, why I ask you is because you talk about the Maker Fest. Yes, I do. Um, happy to talk about it later or do a very brief lightning talk if there's enough time. Thank you. Uh, Octopi, Octoprint is what you want. Octopi? Octo, Octoprint or Octopi running on a Raspberry Pi. I'd like to just say Python 3 has been out for 10 years and things should get moving. Sorry. Fortran 77 still works. Printer, <laughs> but <laughs> one that Epson Ask POS uh, dot matrix ones, and uh, ran into some issues with the buffer uh, overrunning and uh, having to deal with that by putting in a manual timer. Do you have any issues uh, with uh, that with the models that you're using? Um, buffer overrun isn't usually a problem because these images are, are so tiny. Um, serial overrun is a problem because if you're running serial TTL, it's, it's just generally awful and slow. Um, but, uh, I didn't have to wait for anything. These are actually, these super cheap printers, which are about 20 bucks, actually use an ARM-based microcontroller and can take data as fast as you can send it. They just can't spit it out the other side as fast. So the real Epson ones actually tend to run slower and have problems. The fake ones just work. Yeah, because uh, I used a real Epson, and I actually had to put in a timer so that every three lines it would wait one second because it only had 8K a buffer, and yeah. a long receipt, you'd run out of it and crop the output. Yeah, that's, that's what I found with the real expensive ones. The cheap ones don't want that nonsense, so they just work. Thank you. Any other questions? Wow. Still got three minutes, you know. I can just stand here and start playing Yan Cat again. Questions? If you, if you, if you no. Um, I can stop early. Um, how, long did it, how long and how much money did it take you to make the project? Um, it took me longer to. I could do all the individual bits, but getting them all to work together, I mean, partly the problem was that there was a couple of modules I really wanted to use that were Python 3 only, and then there's things that wouldn't work at all with Python 3, so it's like, what do I do? So I had to like use different things. Um, it, how much did it cost me? Well, the, the big red bo button and enclosure, I used a little cardboard chipping box as the enclosure, um, some, some simple header wires. Um, the total cost of all parts, uh, you could probably bring it in for under a hundred bucks. Um, yeah, maybe a little over. 
Um, if you're buying like a Raspberry Pi 3 and everything like that, which it doesn't really need. Oh, including the monitor, we found a place in the West End that has refurbed flat panel monitors for 20 bucks. Um, computation on Jane, if anyone knows or cares. So yeah, it was really, really cheap. Yeah? Thank you. Still got a minute 40. I can leave early if you want. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So, um, while Evan sets up, uh, another, well, while Evan gets on the microphone. <laughs> um, okay, uh, who uses Vim? Who uses VI? Who uses Nano? Who uses Atom? Who uses Visual Studio Code? Who who uses I I can't think of another text editor. <laughs> who uses Cat? Do you want to use this? Yeah. Okay. They both record. Just you have to keep it up to your mouth. Oh wait here. playing a game on there. Uh, anyway, if this talk looks like it didn't have a lot of preparation, it did not. I was asked to do it uh, at dinner before coming here. So if it seems like there's a, lot, there's a lack of prep, uh, please understand. Uh, there was no prep. So, uh, sorry, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, my name's Evan Leibovich. I'm a bit of a long timer here. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do here, this is actually less of a talk than a solicitation. Uh, I want to encourage anybody who wants to talk back or ask questions or give opinions, because basically what I want to do actually is revisit a topic uh, that I looked at about 15 years ago. Uh, I had the fortune of doing a series of columns for open source in the turn of the century. I still like saying that. Uh, <laughs> turn of the millennium. Okay, not, there's, not just the century. That's right. And one of the pieces I did was, uh, in, these in the days where it was still a very, very difficult slog to try and convince people to use open source and Linux. And when Microsoft was not all of a sudden on board with Linux and installing it and, and making it available. So there were a lot of uh, things going on. One of the biggest knocks against Linux and open source was uh, what was called the fragmentation. And so the thing is, well, there's just one version of Windows. Put aside what you know better, OK? OK, there's one version of iOS. There's one version of Windows. Why is there a site called DistroWatch that has scores upon scores upon scores of different ones with arrows that showing what's more popular this week or whatever? Um, you know, just a few seconds ago, there was a poll, you know, who's using a Debian-based? Well, that doesn't even matter anymore because you have things that are Debian-based, such as Ubuntu, and then you things that are based on Ubuntu, such as Mint. So now you're going to this second level of redirection of, of things where there's, so I believe with Mint, there's Mint repositories, there's Debian repositories, and there's Ubuntu repositories, and it points at all of them. And as long as they get it right, it's not an ungodly, unholy mess. So um, what, I, what I was trying to get feedback for is I've been asked to write uh, a new blog for uh, a website and they wanted me to revisit an article that I did back in 2001 called Why Linux is Like Pizza. And the theory behind it was is that the diversity of open source and Linux is actually a strength, not a weakness. That, that the similarities to pizza that I identified were sort of, well, if you wanted, you had your choice of these stable multinational conglomerate blobs of Linux or pizza. But also, if you wanted, uh, the recipe was generally known. And if you wanted to do your own, you could do it. And if you wanted to use the Megacorp ones, you could do that. And if you wanted the cute little niche ones, 
you know, the ones that were specifically for artistic or the ones that were specifically for education, uh, that you could do that too. And so basically what I'm just trying to do is find out if anybody here has any comments about how the fragmentation of Linux distributions has changed. Back when I wrote this, I was responding to another writer who said that he would bet money that within five years of 2001, the only distributions left standing would be Caldera and Red Hat. And I took him up on the offer, which he hasn't paid back yet, um, for no other reason than he excluded Debian. And Debian, unlike other, either Caldera or Red Hat, did not have corporate overlords to, re to reply to. And because Debian from the very beginning was community-based, I had the sense back then that it would never go through the vagarities, you know, Caldera went through. That's a long story unto itself. Red Hat is still around, but back in 2001, nobody imagined what would happen with Ubuntu. Nobody imagined that SUSE would stick around, maybe not to be a massive mainstream thing, but it's still doing very well for itself. Um, and so in the last five minutes of this, uh, basically I'm sort of opening the floor and asking if anybody has any thoughts on the state of the diversity of open source and how it's changed in the last decade or so, how the nature of it has changed. So. I wanted to, to bring up the idea of like, there's a, there used to be um, a version of Ubuntu called Ubuntu Studio, which was specifically created for designers. That need has kind of gone away because it's become a lot easier to configure and set up complex audio equipment, basically. Um, but there are spins. I, I really like the idea of the Fedora's project where they have different variants of different operating, of different versions of Fedora that basically specialize in certain areas. So as an example, there's a security version. There's, um, there's a there's a design version, and I believe there's one that's specifically for kids. So I like that idea. The utility of the niche really hasn't gone away. No, like Kali Linux is still probably your best bet for doing um, pen penetration testing. You know, like in the end of the day, you're going to want to have the thing that has the most tools in it, largely because sometimes those tools are extremely difficult to, to kind of add in. I'm taking up too much time, so I'm going to let you talk. No, no, just one more thing to flesh out your question, Miles. So is the difference now based on what set of apps they bring in by default, or is there, is there more to it than that? I would say it's, it's a combination of, like, the apps that are brought in by default. Like, a lot of people dislike a lot of Ubuntu's ideas, so... There's the Richard Stallman version of Ubuntu, which I can't remember the name of. Libra, B Libra 2? Tresco? Yeah, try oh. So, you know, okay. there's a different distribution for everyone's need. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, please go to the microphone. I would like to point out that Ubuntu does have a corporate overlord, okay? Apart from that, I like your pizza idea. You, like, and, and like the things that are no good, like it's just one programmer having fun for a little while. Well, they die and fall off the map. The, the useful things stick around. Sorry, so because of open source, you can have one person that says, I'm going to do something great, then they fall off the face of the earth, but because the code is still there, anyone can still pick it up if it was a good idea. And that's the theory. I don't know how much that's actually happened in real practice. And uh, yeah, I, I understand what you said about Ubuntu, uh, the corporate sort of machinations of canonical are sort of a, a different story and a bit of a soap opera unto themselves. Um, I think the most successful Linux distribution, it could be argued, is Android. Um, I don't know whether we want to count it as one, but it's interesting how you decide whether it's a distro or not, a Linux distro. Um, I don't know if I'd call Android a distro, but I might call AOSP a distro in the sense that you have Android... With all, with all the proprietary bits taken out of it and the stuff that Google wants to release as open source uh, constitute Android. There's still significant bits that have to be added, but if you go on to a place like XDA or whatever, there's a lot of people that have taken 
the open source chunks of Android that have been released and have actually turned that into ROMs that people can use to replace on their phones. So for instance, I have a, a, a Galaxy Note 2, which is like five, six years old. It's still running a current version of Android thanks to the ability to put on a new, distrib a, a, a new, a new distribution, if you would, a new version of Android. So I think you're partially right. Android itself is a Google blob, but there's a significant chunk called AOSP, or maybe I have it wrong if somebody wants to correct me, but AOSP seems to be the open source blob that people can do open sourcey things with. So the reason I said I'm not sure if it's a distro is because the distros you mentioned are all of a kind, and you'd call them GNU Linux if you were religious because a large... There's a core that's the Linux kernel, and then there's other stuff that's sort of GNU stuff on top of it. Android doesn't have that GNU stuff. It's just the kernel plus the various kinds of Google software. If you still call that a Linux distro, you have a different meaning from the word. If you, Well, at its, at its core, is the kernel vaguely related to something created by Linus Torvalds? Absolutely it is. Okay, so by some definitions at least, it is a Linux-based system. Yes. Right? The way Stallman always likes to say, a Linux-based GNU system. Okay, are there any other questions? Because I've got a whopping 20 seconds left. Chris, you get the last word. Yeah, I think, but we, we've got many phenomenon, phenomena going on simultaneously. So it's, Hugh has, Hugh had the, the point of we've got different things. We've got some different things going on than we had 20 years ago. So Android is peculiar. That's worth poking at because it's strange. We also have like things like the um, system management things, uh, Docker, Ansible, and so forth as system system construction things we have more flavors than we had we have different flavors of things going on than we had 20 years ago that, that's worth pointing out yeah plus plus lots of stuff that's feeding from the same streams everyone's using libc or everyone's using glibc everyone's using um Linux kernel from common sources. Plenty, plenty, plenty of other things like that. All your base now belong to system D. <laughs> but the, li you should, the list of things sort of goes on, and we get, we've got some strangely shaped things compared to yesteryear. Okay, thanks to Chris, we can start right away. Hi, um, so I, I had a slide that came up with the back of the So I want to criticize Evan and tell him that I really am not prepared for it. I'm curious computing. This is something that's new to me. I have always been really curious about computers. I dive deeply into them and understand them from the bottom up and master them. Well, that's not true anymore. It's maybe because I'm older and maybe because the computers are more annoying. But this thing is running Android and they're all kind of quirks that I don't understand the system to. I just do what I know how to do. I get surprises of features that I didn't know were there. I want things and I don't know how to find them. I'm not willing to invest the time in them. This is what we used to, some people call losers. The users that don't really understand. Well, I'm one of them when it comes to Android. And I want to understand that phenomenon better because I'm used to knowing what's going all, on all the way down. Um, well, one thing that's happened in the Linux world, leave alone Android at the moment, it's become so complicated that it's very, very hard to be a master of it all. When I started um, on Unix, there was a book this thick that listed the whole kernel and explained it. Okay, And the man pages were maybe that thick. And I could read them and, and not quite memorize them, but know where everything fit. In Linux, 
not everything is even documented, and the documents are too big. But I've been able to understand the structure of it because the shape of the thing as a baby really determines the thing as an adult. The way Linux has grown up, it's accretive at a modest speed of complexity. System D accepted. OK. Um, but Android is a whole new surface. And I'm just annoyed by it because I'm forced to learn this. It wasn't my choice. I need to use this thing. And um, there's no golden road to understanding it. So now I'm puzzled. Now I'm, now I'm one of these losers. And I feel I'd like to understand it better. What's the right approach to, uh, to learning about something as complicated as that? How do you learn? the things that are worth the bother and ignore the ones that aren't. I've noticed people who come later to Linux and I don't know they call themselves full stack programmers and all these other things, they've learned how to surf on top of the complexity. Whereas I used to know how to dive right to the bottom. But when you're using something like new user interface Android, there's still another tool. And I'd be interested if people have any philosophy of how to deal with that. So I'm one of these full stack developer people that surfs on top of the complexity. Um, I think that, I think what it comes down to nowadays is that there used to be a certain type of person who wanted to know exactly how, as an example, a car worked. They got themselves, they changed their own oil. They did, they changed blank fluid. They did everything possible that they could fix, they fixed themselves. Um, since things have added more complexity, it has become less of an urgency to know how to do a lot of those things, especially too considering the, you can call a mechanic quickly and get, get it fixed through a different system. I, I think, and this is actually one of my major issues when we, when we teach anyone computing, is the, the, the kind of method we've been doing for years is the idea of we're going to go, we're going to take you down to the very bottom and we're going to slowly work our way up. And I think that was a large portion of how we taught, how we, and we continue to taught, and I don't think that's a good idea. Because what ends up happening is we get a lot of people who think that this is too hard, I'm going to just not do this anymore. And you don't teach learning that way. You don't teach anything that way. So I think people kind of just stop caring. And that's basically what happened. So another analogy is computers have become like medicine. Most practitioners don't really understand. They've learned a, a few things that work, let's say. Yeah. And how, how do you develop the skills in ignoring your pain when you don't understand something. You just, you frankly learn it at the point at which you need to learn it at. Um, you know, you don't need to know everything before you can start a project. You should just try to use the tools you existingly know and be able to start it. Like, one of the things that, that I've noticed a lot, especially with people starting and starting doing a new startup or something of that nature, is they want to program it in the new programming language that's out there. Rust, Go, what, what have you. And they go for that. But then what ends up happening is they get over, they have to learn this. And they get boggled down with the very complex nature of everything, which is anything learning anything new. And they end up failing. And it's because they didn't start with what they knew. So if I was to suggest to you where to start on learning Android, I would, as an example, say, like, understand the C library that's incorporated into how you would develop a C application in Android, which I believe is available now. I would start at that kind of base level. Maybe, like, as an example, I know you do um, a version of a Swan. Mm -hmm. I would try to figure out how to port that Swan version to Android using the current kernel system in that structure. I know it's already been done before, but it would be a way for you to take something you already know, your existing knowledge, and be able to put it into a different environment. So I'm going to admit something embarrassing. I wasn't meaning I was finding Android difficult as a programmer. I was finding it difficult as a user. Oh, so um, I would take a similar approach and say, as an example, 
edit a photo, <laughs> uh, resize a photo. Um, it's the same thing I tell new Linux users is do what you normally would do in Windows or Mac OS X and try to find that version in, the, in your giving operating system. Working with Android, there is no equivalent on Windows or Mac. It's a different form factor. It's a different way of interfacing. This may be, one again, one of those kind of generational things where the kids will teach the parents how to use it because the parents are used to one paradigm of how to talk to a computer, and the kids are growing up with something else totally. But I want to expand on your medical analogy because I think what we've gone in, we've now gone to a level of maturity and complexity where it's really, really difficult to be a general practitioner anymore. And so you have people that are specializing and you have people that are just, you know, getting involved in the GUI and the human factors and people that are just getting involved in making new devices work with it. And that kind of, you know, it's simple enough that I can do a little bit of programming and I can make anything work with it. May We may be past that. But, I mean, there's enough people that know Android to do a couple of things. Number one, we've now got a user base in the billions, and you now have an awful lot of people that are making some really good money off of making apps for it. So, clearly, there's some people that are getting what they need out of it. Uh, whether that equates to us in this room that have been around the block with old-style Linux, desktop for Linux for an awfully long time, it's it's a different paradigm. You can't say, well, I'm used to, you know, the KDE versus GNOME versus Cinnamon wars mean nothing when you're talking on Android. It's irrelevant, and people will laugh at you if you talk about it uh, because there there's that. And so it's now the question is, like, what version? Was it donut or ice cream or eclair or whatever the hell dessert? Uh, sorry? Nougat, nougat. No, O is coming. I don't know what the what what. Okay, so so we'll say Oreo. Okay. <laughs> and anyway, but the point being, I think in some cases it may be a bit of a generational shift, not just with the people, but also with the tech. But I think it's also the number of people involved with open source has mushroomed, as much as the complexity of the system. So now you've got specialists and all sorts of things, which may go back to the last thing on distribution. You can have a distribution that has nothing but penetration security. People didn't even think about that kind of specialization 10 years ago. Now it's a thing. So I call this uncurious users because um, I guess most people really aren't curious about their computers. They just want to get a job done. And that, I years ago, I used to find it infuriating when I was trying to explain why something worked. They didn't want to know. They wanted to just get a little menu. Yeah. Well, I'm turned into that person. Yeah, but what, what it means is the technology supposedly is just a layer that allows you to do something else, whether it's to write a document, whether it's to figure out a scientific formula, whether it's to design a building. Uh, I'm, I, I think what's happening is that the tech itself is less relevant than what it f allows people to do. And I'm not necessarily sure that's a bad thing, because if somebody's an architect, they want the tech to get out of the way and let them do what they do. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Hugh, uh, Mike, you're up next with Upstart. <laughs> oh, uh, do, you want, do you have a HDMI? Uh, no. Uh, HDMI adapter. I think it's still here. Okay. Yeah, it's still here. Who who likes SQLite database? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> who who likes um, MySQL? Yay! Um, who likes Postgres? Who who likes um, MongoDB? <laughs> who likes flat files? <laughs> okay, great. Um, So I, I had a huge issue with MariaDB recently because they didn't have a lot of the, do you have the mic on? No, I do not. Okay, it's right there.
You didn't turn. You turned it off. Can we put it up to your mouth? All right, so my name is Mike, and today I want to talk to you about Upspin. Uh, has anyone heard of Upspin? Okay. Um, so Upspin is a project that was developed by uh, Rob Pike and some of the Google engineers, and it's built all in Go. Um, and essentially what it's meant to do is uh, allow universal access to secure shareable data. So it's not a product so much as it is a set of protocols and rules that can be built on top of other layers. Uh, so Upspin itself is composed of three items. Uh, there is a key server, there is a directory server, and there is a storage server. And typically right now uh, in the early days, the storage server and the directory server are kind of together. Um, but the key server is uh, maintained by one organization. But they want to eventually offload that to some other party. Like they don't want to be uh, responsible for it. And essentially what the key server has is the public keys of the users that signed up with uh, the service. So um, why is this useful? Like why would anybody want to use it? Um, a person like myself has a few laptops and desktops that I work on or manage different servers. And sometimes I want to get that one file off that system. Um, usually you would go to rsync or scp or if you're going from my Mac to Mac, maybe airdrop it. Um, sometimes you pull out your thumb drive, you plug it in, you put your file on the thumb drive and then put it into your other computer. But essentially what Upspin does is allows you to bring in those items from whatever network storage uh, system it is and bring it into your own local namespace. And I prepared a short demo, so I got this thing working. I read through the docs. Um, it's a little bit cumbersome, like Miles said with Mastodon, but it works. It has some rough edges, but uh, it has some practical use. So, oh, and going back to the original point of uh, secure, so let's say you have um, a VM or some sort of storage in the cloud. Technically, those clouds are accessible to that provider, so they could see those items. Here, as soon as an item leaves your computer, it is encrypted over the wire and at the other end. So I'll show you later on what it looks like when, let's say, the provider takes a look at your file system, what that would look like to them, let's say it got hacked or breached. So actually, what I want to show you right now. Uh, I'm going to have to put Log into ah demos never work. Oh wow, it's a good day today. <laughs> so here I'm logged into a Google Cloud instance. So this is a VM that I have set up, and it's on Google Cloud. And okay, I'm going to switch to the Upspin user. So that's the user that uh, has the storage of what I'm storing there, and to them. This is what they would see. They would see just a bunch of encrypted files. There's no way they can get access to them. Um, and the only way you can actually get access to them is to have a private key in order to decrypt it. So let's say I'm on my computer and I put hello GTA log into Upspin. Uh, essentially what it's going to do is create a file within uh, that VM in the cloud. And let's say I wanted to share this with somebody. All I would have to do is drop an access file into this username slash public and say read colon and put, for example, Miles's username. And all he would need to do is do upspin get and he would have access to that file and he would be able to see. Uh, exactly what that file says. In this case, uh, hello GTA log. Now let's see. Upspin get, so your username, slash public, slash GTA log. So this is going over to the Google Cloud, retrieving that file, and 
That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I keep forgetting the mic. It's secure in the sense that instead of the raw file existing on that VM, it is encrypted in flight and on the server. I'm not sure if that. Uh, no, the file itself exists in one place. It exists on the storage end, but it's encrypted while it's stored there. So as soon as it left my laptop, it was already encrypted. Um, you said you could share it with somebody, but you didn't share a private key at the same, same time. So I don't understand how he could encrypt it and get it. So let's say you're a user that signed up with, or um, actually, let me show you. I had this prepared. Uh, whoop. So this is the key server. It has publicly available all the public keys. Um, and I, I'm going to be honest, I didn't fully look into it. I'm still exploring this, so it's kind of new days. But if you drop an access file into that directory, if that person has signed up and they have their own private key uh, on the same system that they're using Upspin with and trying to retrieve a file, they will have access to wherever that access file is. Like I normally think of simple um, public key, private key systems. Maybe this isn't one of those. But I would think I'd want to keep my private key on my machine and not put it on the key server. A hundred percent. You have full control and over your own private key. So you're, I guess I get the, if I'm sharing it with, with Walter, I get Walter's public key and use it to encrypt a second copy of the document. I no, no, not, not even that complex. So let's say I wanted to share it with Miles. Miles has his public key, read, or he has uh, a private key, and his public key is on the key server. He automatically has access to that file. So if he goes upspin and runs the exact same command, and I put an access file in that directory, he and only he will be able to see that file. Everybody else will get a... See, uh, I think the server, the file server, has to have a copy encrypted with your key and a copy encrypted with Miles' key. Isn't that the case? No, he has his own key on his machine. I have my own key on my machine. Okay. Yeah, it always, the very first thing it does is look up in the key server if that person or username exists. In this case, they're using email addresses as the usernames, but it could have been something else. It's just what they're using. 